red wine and data falsification. Um, this is a story that came up in several news uh, uh, places. Uh, the one I'm starting with is CBS News. Um, it was entitled, Red Wine Researcher Flagged for Fake Data. And uh, it's actually somewhat old news, but I haven't covered it before, and I think it's significant enough to do so, and so uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, cover it now. The gentleman in question is in the picture. Um, And the article that we start with starts uh, Hartford, Connecticut, a University of Connecticut researcher known for his work on the benefits of red wine to heart health, falsified his data in more than 100 instances, and nearly a dozen scientific journals are being warned of the potential problems after publishing his studies in recent years, officials said Wednesday. Now, for what it's worth, that's not 100 different articles, that's 100 different instances of falsification several of which would go to any particular article. University of Connecticut officials said that their internal review found 145 instances over seven years in which Dr. Deepak Das fabricated and falsified data. And the U.S. Office of Research Integrity has launched an independent investigation of his work. Das, a tenured surgery professor, he can't be fired except for very special causes, and apparently this is one of them, by the way, Director of the Yukon Health Center's Cardiovascular Research Center has gained national attention in recent years for research into the beneficial properties of resveratrol, which is found in red wine. Now, for those of you who are biochemically inclined, resveratrol has that structure. Basically, it's a phenol hooked to a resorcinol with a styrene-type uh, bond, and that bond can be cis or trans, but apparently the trans is the more common one. Um, that's from Wikipedia for what it's worth. University of Connecticut officials did not say Wednesday whether the falsification occurred in research on the topic or others. Um, although we will find out that definitely at least some of it had that research, it was on that subject. The research, uh, the university's health center recently declined to accept 890,000, almost a million dollars in federal grants awarded to him as its review was underway and has frozen all other external source of funding for his lab. That's pretty strong. Dismissal proceedings have also been launched against Das. So in, fact, in spite of the fact that he's tenured, apparently if you lie uh, when you're doing your research, uh, tenure is no protection. Or at least it's not enough protection who has been employed by the Health Center since 1984 and was granted tenure in 1993. Das could not immediately be reached Wednesday, and a message was left for the union uh, representing him. So now we're into uh, management union uh, interface there as well. Eleven scientific research journals that have published Das's work are being notified of the problems, which came to light after a three-year review sparked by an anonymous complaint in 2008 of potential irregularities in his research. We have a responsibility to correct the scientific record and inform peer, re peer researchers across the country, said Philip Austin, interim vice president for health affairs, said in a written statement about the notifications to the 11 scientific journals. He said the three-year review required considerable time because it had to be exhaustive and that while they are deeply disappointed by the flagrant disregard for Yukon's conduct codes, Austin said they are grateful that the anonymous tipster notified authorities. The abuses in one lab do not reflect the overall performance of the Health Center's biomedical research enterprise, which continues to pursue advances in treatment and cures with the utmost of integrity. Austin said, we demand full compliance with all research standards and policies by our faculty and staff. And uh, I'm going to skip the rest of the article because I don't think it's all that relevant. Um, but you can read it at the link if you want to. Um, a little more specialized thing tells us, um, uh, a source tells us a little bit more about this fraud. 
red wine researcher charged with Photoshop fraud by Meds Medscape Medical News um, by Robert Lowe's in January 13 of 2012. And you can get this on the internet, but you may have to register, at least I did. Um, in January 13, 2002, a University of Connecticut researcher known for touting the health benefits of red wine is guilty of 145 counts of fabricating and falsifying data with image editing software, according to a three-year university investigation made public Wednesday. Unfortunately, that link is dead. And skipping on down because we've read some of this already. Uh, the review board findings point to a pervasive attitude of disregard within the CRC for commonly accepted scientific practices in the publication and reporting of research data, its report states. State, Given the large number of irregularities discovered in this investigation, the uh, SRB can only conclude that they were the result of intentional acts of data falsification and fabrication designed to deceive. And uh, moving on down, the other members of the CRC played a part in research fraud, and they are under investigation as well. So at least at that time, it wasn't done yet. Uh, and the next section is entitled, No Resemblance to Any Legitimate Experiment. The exact nature of the alleged fraud involves images of blots obtained through gel electrophoresis that were figure featured in article figures. Most of the figures presented Western blots designed for studying proteins. Using Photoshop software as a forensic tool, the review board determined that dozens of images bore evidence of inappropriate manipulation by photo imaging software. Whether it is um, uh, Photoshop or GIMP or one of the other ones is not totally clear but it doesn't really matter. The most egregious examples were pasted up artificial blots that, quote, bear no resemblance to any legitimate experiment and re represent total fabrications. Just made up the data. The board also found examples of background erasure, image duplication, and images having been spliced together. Sweet. Moving on, the review board restated that as head of the lab and senior author of, of all but one of the tainted articles, Dr. Das, quote, bears principal responsibility for the fabrication and or falsification that occurred. Furthermore, the evidence, quote, strongly suggests, end quote, that Dr. Das was directly involved in faking images for publication. Some of that evidence was pulled from his personal computer. For what it's worth, the defense was, well, I didn't do that. I don't know. I, my computer is, could be manipulated by who knows whom. Now, his defense, the accused researcher cites racial hatred. Ugh, pull out the race card. You know, uh, the, I'm sorry, you, ignore that university. That has something else, and I should, it should have been edited out. Um, the report quoted Dr. Das as saying he does not know who prepared the figures that appeared in the journal articles. It stated that he has provided, quote, no substantive information, end quote, that could explain the research irregularities. An exhibit in the report contains what the board called Dr. Das's response to the investigation. In a document dated July 30, 2010, Dr. Das said the accusations against him are part of a campaign to rid the University Health Center of the, quote, Indian community. Quote, I became the devil for the health center, and so did all the Indians working for me, he wrote. The evidence for conspiracy and racial hatred is overwhelming. Lovely. Now, skipping down a little further, the website of resveratrol partners highlights some of Dr. Das's studies on the cardio uh, benefits of resveratrol. In yesterday's press relief, res resveratrol partners, managing partner Bill Sardi, said that Dr. Das does not have any business relationship with the company and that other researchers have confirmed the value of 
and Longevinex. So, you know, he's not one of ours, although they used to quote his articles a lot. Well, Longevinex is uh, a particular preparation of resveratrol that you could at that time buy. I don't know if you can still do it or not. Probably so, but I haven't looked it up. Um, now, this one, if you go to the link that gets you directly there, unfortunately, it will reroute you to another link so that you will realize this is the article that tipped everybody off. It's called Redox Regulation of Resveratrol Mediated Switching of Death Signal into Survival Signal. And you can see the uh, uh, Das, Khan, Mukherjee, Bagchi, Gusami, Swartz. I'm not acquainted with that as an, an Indian name, but, uh, and then of course uh, Deepak Das himself. Um, and uh, it's in Free Radical Biology and Medicine, 2008. And if you get the, um, the article, it's pretty obvious that they want you to notice that, uh, that they're not standing behind this article anymore. Um, it's uh, been retracted. Um, and uh, I'll just go over the abstract so that you understand kind of more or less, it's complicated, uh, what, uh, what they were looking at. In this study, we determined the changes in the intracellular redox environment of the heart during ischemia and reperfusion and the effects of resveratrol on such changes. Because redox regulation by thioreduxin plays a crucial role in signal transduction and insider protection against ROS, um, and that's oxidation stress, but I don't know what the R is. Uh, the effect of resveratrol on the changes in the amount of theoredoxin were monitored in an attempt to determine the role of intracellular theoredoxin in resveratrol-mediated changes in the intracellular re redox environment and its role in resveratrol-mediated cardioprotection. If your head is swimming at this point, it's <laughs> basically Resveratrol protects the heart, and they were testing whether theoredoxin played a crucial role in this or not. Um, and so what they did, were rats were randomly divided into four groups, group one, control, which were just, they fed them by stomach tube, so if they couldn't eat it, it wasn't a matter of, you know, if they didn't eat enough, why it, would, it wasn't good enough. Um, two, rats were given the resveratrol along with that uh, vehicle. Three, um, they were given the resveratrol, but they were given shRNA, which is active against TRX1, so uh, theoredoxin 1 they were trying to get rid of. Uh, group four, they were given resveratrol, but they were treated with cisplatin. That's a cancer t uh, therapy, and it, as I recall, interferes with um, DNA production. Um, in concert, two groups of mice, so now in addition to the rats, they're going to do two groups of mice, um, and it looks like this is one that doesn't have uh, uh, theoredoxin normally, and a corresponding wild type group were also gavaged with 2.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight resveratrol for 10 days. Um, so they were they were uh, they had two groups of mice and then a control group of other mice that were not genetically similar. After 10 days, isolated rat and mouse hearts perfused via working mode were made globally ischemic for 30 minutes, um, clamped off the coronary arteries or just simply didn't feed blood into them, I'm not sure which. Uh, it doesn't really matter at this point because the, uh, the article was retracted. Um, 
uh, ischemia reperfusion developed an infarct, infarct size of about 40% and resulted in about 25% apoptotic cardiomyocytes. That is to say that about 25% of the heart cells were starting to degenerate on their own in a naturally programmed way. Um, and uh, which were redu reduced by resveratrol. But interestingly, it doesn't say exactly how much, but um, we'll see some nice little statistics later on. Cisplatin, but not SHRNA, TRX1. In other words, getting rid of theorodoxin didn't really help, but cisplatin did abolish the cardioprotective abilities of resveratrol. In the experiments with mouse hearts, similar to rat hearts, resveratrol significantly reduced the ischemia reperfusion mediated increase in infarct size. Now, I have a question at this point. Why did they switch to mice? Why bother? Why not just keep using rats the whole way through? But whatever. Um, uh, and apoptosis in both groups. Uh, apparently, maybe they're trying to demonstrate it works in two different species. MDA formation, a presumptive marker for lipid peroxidation, was increased in the um, ischemia reperfusion group and de reduced in the resveratrol group. And uh, so resveratrol protected against peroxidation. And uh, resveratrol-mediated reduction in MDA formation was abolished with cisplatin, but not with SHRNA TRX1. Uh, ischemia reperfusion induced reduction in GSH, uh, which is uh, relative of theorodoxin, um, to the GSH to the GSSH, which is one of the uh, ways of reducing, uh, was prevented by resveratrol, and resveratrol mediated preservation of that ratio was reduced by cisplatin, but not by SHRNA TRX1. Their point being that interfering with theorodoxin doesn't matter as much, but interfering with DNA or RNA synthesis with cisplatin does. RT-PCR revealed an increase in both TRX1 and TRX2 transcripts, but only TRX2 protein, not TRX1 protein, was enhanced with resveratrol by Western blot analysis. So TRX1 apparently is irrelevant in this setting. Um, Electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopic study revealed that resveratrol treatments significantly increased the de decay rate of nitroxide radicals compared with to control hearts, suggesting that resveratrol can switch into reduction state more compared with con to control heart. I think that's um, a little rough English, but then given that most of the people are from India, I, I will excuse that. Finally, resveratrol generated a survival signal by phosphorylation of AKT and increase in induction of BCL2 expression, which was inhibited by cisplatin but not by SHRNA TRX1. So, taken together, the results of this study indicate that resveratrol provides cardioprotection by maintaining intracellular redox environments in spite of ischemia. And TRX2 is likely to play a role in switching IR-induced death signal into survival signal. So TRX1 is mostly irrelevant from what I can gather. Well, that's what they're saying. And you read the article, and here's these nice little graphs, you know, and more graphs, and some nice little Western blots, and some more nice little Western blots, and some more graphs, and uh, there's the control rate and the resveratrol rate, and you have no idea whether you should believe them or not. They made it up. And um, just for fun, I googled how much we can find of Deepak Das and red wine. Uh, this is a Google Scholar, and you will notice that the um, here's um, red wine uh, antioxidant resveratrol protects by D Deepak Das and others. Myocardial protection with red wine uh, extract by Deepak Das and others. And this one is labeled retracted resveratrol. 
delivers either survival or death signal, Deepak Das and others. And then resveratrol and red, red wine, healthy heart and longevity, and um, heart failure reviews, 2010. And here's another one that's retracted. And then uh, grapes, wine, and, and resveratrol and heart health. So he's publishing not just the ones that are retracted, but dozens of other articles. In fact, as we keep going here, um, you can see here he's, he's branched out to doing some white wine stuff. Talking about the French paradox, they drink, they smoke, they don't live healthfully, and yet they live a long time. Why is that? Um, of course, for Adventists, it's the other way around, but, you know. Um, and it is grapeseed proanthocyanin, so maybe there's more to it than just resveratrol. Interestingly enough, it's not being tested for alcohol itself, so maybe we can get all the advantages without any of the any of the uh, defects. And here you'll notice that there's some more. And if you keep going, you can see there's over 100 articles that just pop up right away. As you get out to here, you'll start to get more references. And in fact, I'm going to take you to the next one. Um, uh, and you'll notice that at, at about 100, you're starting to get uh, the French paradox hoax, somebody else citing DOS. And uh, Redox regulation of anti, and this one is written by DOS, and now we're starting to get into citations. So this, somebody said that he'd written something like 450 articles or so, uh, which is just amazing. That, you know, for what, 20 years? That's churning them out at uh, 20 articles a year, which is pretty good output. Definitely, if you publish that much, you're not going to perish. Well, unless you get caught falsifying data anyway. And the French paradox hook I thought was kind of interesting. It's written by Dylan DeLang, and unfortunately, I didn't get the whole thing, but I got the part of it that you can get on the Internet, which is, um, wouldn't it be nice if a glass a day kept the doctor away? Consuming something as palatable as red wine and realizing you are doing good for your heart. Apparently, there is... Scientific evidence to support this idea. In the leading article of this issue of CML Cardiology, Deepak Das eloquently sums up why consuming red wine might be good for our hearts. However, despite all the evidence, some reservations need to be expressed. So apparently, uh, even before any of this uh, difficulty with his publications came up, uh, somebody else is um, not totally convinced. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have started out with, wouldn't it be nice if a glass of a day kept the doctor away? And it's CML cardiology, and I don't know the pages because it's not listed in the... It was very interesting, uh, the way that came through in, the, uh, in Google Scholar. Um, now, there's an outfit called Retraction Watch, which some of you may have heard of, which is basically looking at how many articles are actually pulled back and why and, um, you know, so, sort of shining a spotlight on them. And um, uh, I'll just go through a few par paragraphs and not necessarily all chronological order, or, or I should say not, I think they are chronological order, but they're not sequential. Another update, the Chronicle of Higher Education's Tom Bartlett covers the story with comments from resveratrol booster David Sinclair. Bartlett also has links to a 49-page executive summary of the 60,000-page report, and unfortunately that link is dead. Uh, and, and to Das's long and rambling response to investigators that accuses the university of discrimination and claims he suffered a stroke because of the stress. One has to be alerted to the possibility of a witch hunt here, says Sardi. You may remember Sardi is... Um, the guy who runs that resveratrol company. The, this is his initial reaction. Since Dr. Das has made landmark contribu contributions to the understanding of resveratrol and how it works, 
There are billions of dollars of drug scale, sales that are threatened by resveratrol. Notice a kind of a, a conspiracy theory, which not only protects the heart prior to a heart attack, but thins the blood and prevents clots in coronary arteries, inhibits inflammation, controls cholesterol, and dilates, widens. I don't know if he did that himself or not. Um, blood vessels to maintain normal blood pressure. Uh, resveratrol and Longevinex threaten to replace many problematic heart dr drugs which have not been demonstrated to reduce mortal heart attacks, says Sardi. That's an interesting turn of phrase because I would have expected a, um, fatal heart attacks. Uh, so I wonder if this guy's language is, uh, uh, original language is not English. Probably not. Anyway, uh, now, interestingly enough, a little further down in the article, there's another response from Sardi which has an entirely different tone to it. We have now had opportunity to read the entire report by the University of Connecticut and find it particularly disturbing in its details and implications. As a company, we do not wish to be associated with scientific research that does not meet the highest levels of scientific standards. We stand with the University of Connecticut in its efforts to root out any scientific fraud. Quite a change from uh, the previously read paragraph from Sardi. Anyway, uh, there's another, as you can imagine, there's this a few of these articles that you can find. Uh, and this one is kind of important for the, um, for the global assessment. Now for the last big issue, what does this do to the whole resveratrol sirtuin field? Apparently there's another uh, compound called sirtuin that, that has been found in red wine as well. Not as much as you might think. As mentioned above, DAS really doesn't seem to have been that big a figure in it despite cranking out the publications, and a lot of interesting, although confusing, work has come from a variety of other labs, although confusing. In other words, it sounds like there are labs that have found things and other labs that have not found them, and so now we're dealing with uh, uh, a little more mud than resveratrol is good for your heart, therefore drink red wine. As far as I can tell, the six... 50,000 page report has disappeared from the internet and even the 47 page executive summary. I tried googling it in a number of different ways, can't find it. Uh, Das, who is tenured, was in fact fired, as we'll find shortly. Um, the Wikipedia article uh, on Deepak Das states that it was reported by the Hartford Courant in January 2013 that Joss Doss wanted to file a $35 million defamation lawsuit against the University of Connecticut. But he apparently died before the case went to court. Uh, I guess not. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the last thing I found that was fascinated, fascinating was uh, Retraction Watch's comment on uh, late resveratrol researcher Deepak Das manages to revise and publish paper from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll just move on to the, uh, to, uh, I'll give you the a little easier to read uh, format here, I think. And uh, there's the, uh, article, the title, and the, uh, uh, and the link to it, and um, then it starts, follow this timeline if you would. August 14, 2013, former Yukon researcher Deepak Das, who was found to have committed misconduct, submits a paper, this is after he's, you know, has had his little tiff there, um, Submits a paper to Oxidative Medicine and Cellular Longevity. September 19, a month later, Deepak dies. A month later after that, not quite a month, Das submits revisions to his paper in Oxidative Medicine and Cellular Longevity. Uh, October 18, the next day, the paper was accepted 
and then January 12, 2014, it was published. Now, that would appear to be what the timeline on the paper, which lists Doss as corresponding author, along with a Gmail address, says. Doss is corresponding author after he died. Okay. Um, received 14 August 2013, revised 17 October, accepted, published, right? I mean, that's kind of... Uh, now, it, it, admittedly, it doesn't specifically say Das did it, but Das is the first author and the corresponding author. University uh, Now papers, uh, I'm sorry, ignore the university. That's, um, that's another one of those that I didn't clear, clean out and I missed taking it out. Uh, now, papers are occasionally published posthumously, but one would expect that those would note the passing of the scientist and not list him or her as corresponding author along with his or her email address. Correspondence should be addressed to Deepak K. Das at gmail.com. Um, the paper also lists Das' as affiliation as Yukon, despite the fact that he was fired from his post there in 2012, which is even more interesting. Um, we've emailed the DOS email to address to ask whomever's monitoring it for details and have tried to contact the academic editor for the paper and the journal's publisher, Hindawi. We'll update you with anything we learn. And uh, they did update. We heard back from the journal, which didn't exactly answer our question. Remember the question is, why is DOS the corresponding author and how does that fit in with the revisions being accepted in, uh, after he's dead? And why is he listed as a Yukon professor when, in fact, they booted him? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, their answer was, please note that the manuscript titled Anti-Aging Properties of a Grape-Derived Antioxidant are regulated by mitochondrial balance of fusion and fission leading to mitography, da, 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 was sub uh, submitted on August 14, 2013, and Dr. Deepak K. Das has already approved manuscripts submission. That's an interesting way of phrasing it. You would say had in usual English and he has a contribution in scientific content of the paper. Sounds like Hindawi or whoever it is also has a little trouble with English. Um, we are aware that Dr. Das died on September 19, 2013. However, since he has contributed to the scientific content of the manuscript, his name should have been kept in the author's list, yes, but with no notice that he died. And the final version has been approved by other participating authors of the manuscript. Okay. No notice that he died. Uh, no explanation as to why he's the corresponding author when he's dead. And no explanation as to why, I think, uh, he uh, uh, lists his university affiliation as UConn when uh, UConn got rid of him. Anyway. My take on this whole thing. Now, alcohol seems to be a politically charged subject, which is now, now has a certain political correctness attached. Research supporting the conventional wisdom receives less scrutiny than that opposing it. So you can kind of get by with stuff if you're uh, inclined to do that, if you're supporting the status quo. The big advantage of science is that properly done, it is unbiased because the biases on either side of any question tend to balance out, and because the, ob the objective facts are more important than somebody's bias in determining which way science is going to go. At least that's properly done. And the best way to ascertain truth that is amenable to its a method of inquiry. Now, there's some things you can't do by science. You can't determine, for example, who won the Battle of Waterloo by restaging it uh, and checking the different variables. You're going to have to, uh, at the bare minimum, even if you were going to do that, go back and change the variables to what they were historically 
And uh, even that is going to depend on history. And I'm not even sure that you could say that every time it's always going to come out the same way. So there are fields that are actually outside of the bounds of science. And history is one of them. It appears that some are trying to turn science into a support system for their personal agendas. This is just one example, but there are many other ones, including uh, the creation-evolution controversy. Uh, this deliberate bias, in my opinion, undercuts the authority of science, because you know, if people are allowed to say whatever they want, if people are allowed to make up stuff, then science isn't any more reliable than any other uh, field of inquiry. It is appropriate to be skeptical of studies whose conclusions support politically popular agendas, especially if they do not match one's personal experience. That doesn't mean it proves they're wrong, but it does mean you, you're not obligated to, to take them lock, stock, and barrel. It is incumbent on all of us to avoid the trap of believing studies because they support our position. And finally, I think it is incumbent on us to do careful work guarding against bias from our own point of view. And I think those are principles that are there regardless. Now, as far as this impact on research regarding alcohol is concerned, the retraction of all of Das's papers would make apparently, as far as I can tell, little impact on the question. Um, resveratrol, by the way, is found in grapes and raisins as well as in wine, and also in higher amounts in other foods. In some examples are blueberries, raspberries, and mulberries. Apparently, there are some other ones too that uh, are not listed. So, the idea that you have to drink wine because of the resveratrol is probably foolhardy. The alcohol in wine has major side effects, and uh, if you want to go into that, um, there's the YouTube address uh, on uh, what every Adventist science you should know, um, uh, subheading of alcohol. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment here. Any other? Just wait a minute. It'll come out. Have there been any other studies done about the benefits of uh, re drinking wine, whether it's that resveratrol or not, that have been positive um, or negative? Well, actually, if if you if you watch the other. Um, the other uh, uh, video, you'll you will notice that um, that there have been, but some of them have been deliberately. Um, how shall I say this? Um, uh, they have ignored factors that tended to make the non-drinkers look worse uh, than they really are. Uh, in a position that's systematic enough that I almost think that they were kind of happy it came out that way and didn't want to dig too much. Because when you dig through the studies that actually reported, separately, non-drinkers from previous drinkers, who of course would take their, uh, you know, there would be two major reasons why people would move over. One of them being that uh, they were former heavy drinkers and they had to quit because they got cirrhosis or whatever. And obviously those people are, you know, at risk not to live too long. And the other one being that people who were light drinkers perhaps, but who have to quit because now they have to take medicine. Well, why are they taking medicine? Because they're ill. So, you know, those people are now moved from the light drinkers over into the abstainers. <laughs> and that's just, that's not fair. <laughs> and and so there is some systematic bias beyond, uh, for alcohol itself in particular, interestingly. Uh, so uh, you take those with a grain of salt. And there's one other phenomenon that's now happening 
that's making it even worse, and that is that people who would otherwise abstain completely are reading that, oh, I should take a little red wine. Well, I'll take a half a glass a day or something like that, you know, just enough to get the benefits supposedly. And uh, so now they are listed as drinkers, and the reason they're drinkers is because they're healthy people who do everything they're supposed to do. And so now you have moved people from the healthy non-drinkers into the healthy light drinkers. I would have to hold my nose if I were to drink a half a glass of wine every day. I think it tastes abominable, like rotten grapes, very yeasty. Uh, having one having sip once, and having that's all I could stand. Having smelled somebody's white wine once, I can't uh, disagree with you on that. I don't know what it tastes like, but it, it certainly doesn't smell like something I would want. Uh, yes, we have a comment here. Oh, and uh, Nick, uh, let me get to here yeah. and then come back to you, okay? Well, uh, didn't Brian point that out a few years ago that when they compared the two groups that they were not comparable at all? Right. As you said, the group that was supposed to be benefited were more highly educated, they were more prosperous, they had, they had more access to health care, and so all of that, and so the two groups are not comparable at right. all. Right, and not only that, but now we're having it where they are more highly motivated to have their, uh, to do all the things they're supposed to do to, to well, live sure. longer. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's it, you need you need people for whom it's straight across the top um, in order to in order to make the fair comparison, and it's just it's not being made. Uh, and the other thing to say is if it was really that good, how come Adventists are doing so well? Uh, but Lag anyway. time. Uh, the, unfortunately, I don't have that one on video. That's the only reason I didn't, uh, didn't source it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know several Adventists who uh, decided to take, you know, a glass of wine or so. Uh, two of them are already dead by the way. My question is, did the grape industry uh, take advantage of this to promote the consumption of red grapes? Because uh, if, 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 uh, if, if, if wine is good, why not do the grapes and, and bypass the alcohol end of it? Uh, I, I don't know. If they have, I haven't heard it. But it certainly would make sense to, you know, if, if one were doing this from a, a purely uh, uh, economic benefit kind of thing, why not advertise raisins? And we have really high levels of resveratrol. The advantage is that uh, I don't know of any uh, harm in eating on limited amount of grapes. You know, you could eat as many grapes as you wanted to without the harm of the alcohol. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, grapes don't make you crash into telephone poles. They don't ruin your liver as far as I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, comment way in the back here. We shouldn't be too surprised by the problems with the English in some of the uh, stuff you were uh, reporting. Uh, given this publisher, it's one of the uh, notorious ones that we get emails practically weekly about, won't you submit a paper to this journal? And um, I mean, it's pay to publish. If you're willing to pay a fee to them, they're willing to publish just about anything you submit. Yeah, and if it's a 300 buck fee or whatever it is, then, then what you do is you roll it into your grant money. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there is no effective peer review at all. It's just a scam. Yeah, and apparently it's enough of a scam that if you want to, you can fake your own Western blots. Exactly. It'd be interesting if someone did a study, how many Adventist young people, when they read this study, <laughs> says it gives me a license is science. You and I have seen that. Uh, there are some Bible scholars in here, and you read Greek as well. 
Um, when you translate the Bible in English and so many other languages, these folk have taken the liberty of calling wine. You read the Bible, it's wine, wine, wine. wine. I know that I speak Bengali, and when William Carey came to India, he translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into into Bengali and Hindi and other Straight local without languages. Straight going through English first. Yes, and my I was going to bring my Bengali Bible here today. I, everywhere it says freshly pressed grape juice. Nowhere ever in the Bible, anywhere does it say wine. It's so the bosses are here. I mean, I want to throw this to you. This is especially in the in the Muslim countries, we the Christians do a big disservice by calling it wine. It's abominable to them. I'll, I'll shut up now. Interesting. Actually, th there's only one word in the Bible, and it can be well, either way. Oinos in Greek is the juice of the grape. It can also be fermented. And in the Old Testament, you know when it's fermented by what it does to the person. Right. I mean, Noah drinks. Yain, right? Fresh, yain. Freshly pressed no, grape I, juice. I take it back, right, right. Those are the places, but then what it's supposed to be, it was freshly pressed grape juice. The Lord served freshly uh, well, water into wine. Uh huh. Yeah. And it's water into grape juice in the, in, 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 when it's translated into Bengali, which is interesting. We always translate things the way we want it to be the trans translated. I know, I've been a translator. <laughs> Must be a Catholic conspiracy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you knew I was joking. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go into all of the biblical passages because actually in the, in the other video that I linked to here, um, I did go into the biblical passages and showing them very clearly that Wainas uh, can be used in both senses. Yeah, you know, thank you for the, uh, for the correction. Yes, um, uh, Noah drank really wine, and he was drunk. You see, uh, and wine is a mocker, strong drink, da-da-da. But where it was the Lord, like serving uh, in Cana. Cana, right. And it's, it's uh, William Carey, bless his heart, freshly spread grape juice. So now, did he, did he use like four Bengali words to make that work? No, or sir. It's just there's one word. One word. It's kind of like, uh, it would be more like grape juice. Kind yeah, of. it is grape juice. Yeah. Anyone who reads, he could tell that it's freshly pressed grape juice. Yeah. There's a word for it, you see. So and, and we do Christianity in terrible disservice, especially in the, in the Muslim communities. Muslims, so many places... Uh, it says, well, you Christians, you drink, you eat pork and you drink wine. That's you Christians. You know, it's horrible. Even though the best wine is found in Saudi Arabia, by the way, all these guys, you know, they drink like crazy. Am I on? But anyway, <laughs> you know, I, I go through the Dubai going, uh, traveling, and man, you could buy the best wine in Dubai. Best. You see, I don't drink, and one day I was traveling with a Muslim friend of mine, and um, the, the, yeah, no, he was not. So he, and I walked the night before, so I was sleeping, sitting there for the connecting flight. And he says, look, this guy, uh, 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 Imam, Imam, like a pastor, uh -huh. he's asking, the Imam is asking my Muslim friend, is this the best vodka guy I can buy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't, people don't drink, even though uh, when they go into the Western countries, they learn drinking, and then, uh, you know, again, the best drink you could buy in Saudi Arabia. But that's beside the point. The thing is, is that when we walk among the Muslim brothers, you see, um, it makes it so very easier if indeed we have the authentic translation of the Bible uh, that clearly says uh, that the Lord himself did not drink wine, but you study the Bible, it's all, English Bible, it's all translated into wine, and it makes it very hard. Yeah. Well, it, it helps, uh, I mean, yes, it helps the translation, in, or, or hinders it, however you want to phrase that, that, uh, that 
oinos is actually a cognate of wine. I mean, you, I think you can hear the similarity between the t two words. And in fact, it's a cognate of yayin, which is the Hebrew. So, uh, you will find areas where wine seems to be, well, in some cases where it's very clear that it hasn't fermented yet because you put new wine in old bottles, old bottles. Right. And, uh, yeah. and that's, <laughs> that obviously is not fermented because otherwise it wouldn't bust the bottles. Right. So, but, you know, one of the things that, I, that I'm particularly interested in here is, you know, apparently there's stuff there that's just flat out made up. Right. And you don't know which stuff it is. And in fact, um, uh, I, was, I was being told by my son that somebody did some social science studies and 50% of them couldn't be reproduced. <laughs> now, to be fair, I would expect approximately uh, 9.5% not to be reproduced anyway. And the reason for that is that in order to get statistical significance, you have to get out in a 5% area, right? Okay. And so if something is published that is a p-value of 0 0.05, what that means is that one out of 20 of those studies is going to be wrong. And that's basically they're saying we know that it could be, you could be wrong, but it looks probably right, and so we're going to publish it. And then they usually draw the line at 1 out of 20. But that means, of course, that 1 out of 20 studies is not going to be reproduced. So that's 5% right off the top. Then, of course, if you try to reproduce it and you only try once, there is a 5% chance that your study won't <laughs> match the original. So you're back to just about 10%. So I expect 10% of irreproducibility in studies, just off the top. However... 50% is a little too much. And in fact, Amgen recently published a uh, meta study where they were looking at landmark studies in cancer therapy. And of the 53 studies they looked at, 47 could not be reproduced. <laughs> You're just going, whoa. Okay, we'll hand it back to yeah. So at that point, you're going, what should you be believing? And, and what's worse is that on, uh, although cancer chem chemotherapy is a really um, competitive field, you kind of expect, uh, I mean, there, there isn't any, um, there isn't any bias to hide behind particularly except the bias of being on somebody's bandwagon. So at that point, you're going, uh, that's way too much irreproducibility. And I'm thinking now, maybe there's a problem with the process, uh, and maybe science isn't quite as reliable as we like to think. And that's one of the reasons why I say, if they have a, this wonderful published study and it's telling you what you're supposed to know and it disagrees with your personal experience, I'm not sure you're obligated to believe it. But there's a review board, right? You have to go through that first. Well, peer, these peer studies reviews all went through the board. <laughs> Don't believe that peer right? review makes it all right. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I, I mean, maybe it was a very cursory board, but it was officially, it was peer-reviewed. Somebody looked at it and said, well, you know, does this make sense? Does, is the logic tight? But nobody goes back and checks, did you really do those Western blots? Groups, peers. Sometimes it's not even read. They, they don't even I think that's true. Well, I, I think, unfortunately, you're right that occasionally people are just falling down on the job of doing peer review. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, I know that guy. He writes good. Sure. Take it. 
You, you know that name, Jerry Hoffman in uh, emergency medicine. He, 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 is, he cited studies also. Uh, he will say longitudinal studies have shown no benefits of uh, statin drugs in longevity. You know, but, uh, and these are never published because the billions and billions of dollars all over the world, perhaps except when someone has had a heart attack, you know, maybe it does help that. But uh, especially white people who do not have coron proven coronary artery disease, uh, all these statin drugs have absolutely no benefit. But this will never see the light of the day. <laughs> Review board, they, they, you know, whatever they're... <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a huge problem. You know, at that point, what do you know? Uh, how do you know what to believe? Yeah, there you are. How do you look? I, I think I think many years ago, um, the great playwright, what's his name, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, he talked about statistics beautifully. I think he oh, just put it right. Statistics are lies. Damn lie, and no. No, there are three kinds of lies. Lie, damn is not a cuss word. So lie, damn lie, and statistics. You can prove anything you want to, with, uh, whichever way the money flows. Well, I can remember, uh, <laughs> and uh, um, I can remember uh, reading Mark Twain's comment that somebody had noticed that that in his lifetime. The, the Mississippi River had gotten a mile shorter, and so he says you extrapolate this to the to way back when, and the Mississippi River was millions of miles long, and you you get uh, you know what as a uh, hundred thousand years in the future or something like that. Why uh, Cairo would be a suburb of New Orleans? <laughs> uh, this is on a different topic, but actually the same topic of fraud in science. Fraud can be on any side of the table, and it can sometimes be used for worthy causes, but in an unworthy way. Um, about 20, 25 years ago, with the fall of communism, one of the Russian scientists um, linked up with creationists in the U.S. and they were very enamored with this research and it was brain research and he had some kind of credentials but um, he wanted to I guess get an audience in the U.S. and so he published an article in Creation Research Society and the article still there it hasn't been removed um, but probably two-thirds to three-fourths of all the references were in articles in non-existent journals. <laughs> he, he made them sound very good. You know, the Ukrainian Journal of Neuroscience. And there is no Ukrainian jur Journal of Neuroscience. I went through as a librarian years ago when I got wind of this, and very cleverly done. You wish he had put that kind of effort into doing some valid research if he had credentials. I don't know where he ended up at. I think he wanted to uh, be funded by creationism. I think he, wanted, he knew that creationists were around the world and that you can travel and you can have audiences. I don't know what his motive was. but uh, you, you checked in... Uh just to be sure that there wasn't a translation problem there as well. No. There's there's no Ukrainian No. in in Russian or something like that. I went I went you know, we have databases that identify all the scientific journals in the world. Including the foreign ones. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um there were a few legi legitimate ones, but I'm not I couldn't get copies of those journals to see if he actually published them in them. So I don't know. So I guess that's human nature. If if you have some kind of goal that you want and it's not legitimate, you're going to use illegitimate means to achieve that goal. Research is a game. <laughs> well, 
it's not supposed to be a game. But, uh, and, and I think that I think that it is appropriate for the University of Connecticut to can this guy, in spite of the fact that he was from India. You know, I I don't think that your race gives you a free pass to do something like this. But Paul, beyond that, you know how many people he has hurt all over the world. That's what bothers me. How many young people's brains he blew. Oh, I you agree. Know? I agree. Huh. This is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. Very serious stuff. And the sad part of it is they look at it as serious stuff on the other side. Very sad. Very, very sad. You know, and then we're talking about science. And St. Paul says, I th when we look at science, uh, the word should be looked at. It has no problem with the Bible, you see. Then St. Paul, 2,000 years ago, beware of science. science Falsely, falsely so called. So called. Yeah, because true science, science as it is, science yeah. has no problems. Uh, false, that's something that's yeah. false, that's called science, and that's the problem. Interestingly, if I remember correctly, the Greek word there is gnosis, and uh, it got translated into Latin as scientia. Mm. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just a, an interesting little footnote there. Anyway, uh, one comment down here, and then I should probably point out that we have a, uh, it's now a little past 11.30, so I, I know that uh, everybody can't stay. and Maybe we'll take other comments uh, off the record. Oh, just more of a question. I didn't catch the very beginning of the presentation, and uh, I know that a number of years ago, LA Times published big, huge articles. It was a series on exactly the topic of how wine is good for your heart. And I'm wondering if they're going to retract. Nobody's of course retracted. not. <laughs> of course not. They're, they're not a scientific publication, and so retraction just isn't... isn't uh, and, and, and the sad part of it is there will be people who have taken that Los Angeles paper, which is filtered down from the other which is filtered down from the other, and then, and then uh, keep right on running with it forever. And if I want to drink red wine, I find wonderful benefits in it. Yeah. <laughs> you remember yeah. the paper that was in the LA Times, a series like a whole week they talked about it. Well, I, I don't take the LA Times, so I, I don't actually remember it, but you're probably right. Somebody pointed it out to me. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> probably trying to convince you to drink lots of red wine. <laughs> Napa Valley would well, it, if there's if there's anything that's authoritative um, in science, it's the Los Angeles Times. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next week, for those of you who are interested, we're going to be talking about the evolution of two separate systems of DNA uh, reproduction. Not just once, twice. In January 2012, news reports of scientific fraud circulated the globe. A renowned researcher with over 500 published studies and editor of numerous scientific journals stood accused by his university of 60,000 pages of allegations that he had fabricated all of his research studies dating back over four decades. The university posted a website that made all of these allegations public. The allegations were so voluminous that it was difficult not to believe this researcher was guilty as charged. Listen to Dr. Doss discuss his scientific achievements. Deepak K. Das, I'm the, until now, I'm the professor and the director of the Cardiovascular Research Center of the University of Connecticut Medical Center. My main credential is I am a PhD in molecular biology and biotechnology, but later I got SCD or DSC, and I also have an MD honorary degree, and I am 
the honorary scousa from two different universities. It is the highest decoration university can give. At the University of Connecticut, I have been for 30 years approximately, and uh, I wrote at least 500 papers, peer reviewed papers. Many of them are, are uh, reached at top 10 level, and they are cited many times, more than 100 times, and uh, about 200 book chapters and 15 books. My main research area is the molecular signaling of the heart, and that is why I am famous. I am mostly famous on redox signaling, which I started. I had a journal started on redox signaling, which is a very high impact factor now, and we even established a society called Redox Society. So, this is my expertise, and, and there is no one can challenge me, and no one understands this even in the health center. But I have a passion for this kind of research that whether we can use the food as medicine. This is, this is kind of my hobby. So I take many, many uh, things you know, which is of food origin and I want to see whether they can be used as medicine. But subsequently, the charges against Dr. Deepak Das, director of the Cardiovascular Research Center at the University of Connecticut Health Center, were carefully scrutinized. A charge that Dr. Das had the only keys to his office and that he solely had access to his secretive computer that held graphic images that were altered in public studies was quickly refuted. Former students indicated others had keys to his office, including the university's whistleblower, and that the office usually had an open door, not a locked door. Students who did all the laboratory bench work then had access to the main computer to enter their test data prior to publication of any studies. Another false allegation was that Dr. Das had terminated the employment of a student whose work disagreed with Dr. Das's published papers. Former students verify that Dr. Das never terminated that student. She was dedicating most of her lab hours to another researcher, and he simply removed her from his budget. Then, the most egregiously false allegation was made, that all of the conclusions that Dr. Doss had drawn from research studies which demonstrates resveratrol, a red wine molecule, protects the heart from mortal heart attacks in animal experiments were false. Yet the test data in question had nothing to do with the conclusions drawn from the scientific experiments. It was only the biological mechanisms that were in question. For unexplained reasons, when these refutations were aired online, the university suddenly took its website offline. The allegations against Dr. Doss were aired by over 300 news organizations. However, the denial of any wrongdoing was only published by two news sources. The allegations of massive scientific fraud made such a good news story, news agencies weren't about to take a major university to task over the allegations. Radio talk show commentator Russ Limbaugh said, Dr. Doss, quote, made it all up, end of quote. The public was left with the false impression that decades of research showing red wine as well as the molecule resveratrol was false. But other researchers on other continents had independently duplicated Dr. Doss's experiments and had drawn the same conclusions. Why was there such a quick rush to judgment? Why was there a major effort by news media to slam this researcher without any investigative journal into the merits of the charges? Recognize that resveratrol works in a unique manner from any drug. Resveratrol protects before a heart attack occurs, and it was shown in an experimental animal model that it can turn a mortal heart attack into a non-mortal event. This is a biological phenomenon called cardioprotection. Aspirin and statin cholesterol lowering drugs only protect against non-mortal heart attacks. So resveratrol actually is the only agent that is under scientific investigation as a molecule that can prevent sudden cardiac death. Here Dr. Doss explain this now. 
I believe our group was the first one who said that resveratrol is cardioprotective. Before that, resveratrol was shown to work for cancer research. That's how Pujito found out from the University of Chicago. We are the first one who started working on resveratrol and said that it is good for heart, heart benefits and uh, healthy heart. And so we did, we did a lot of work. We did signal transduction to other works. And we are the first one who said it depends on the dose and it has hormetic effect, hormesis, so that you one has to use very low dose of resveratrol. I mean, world before didn't believe it, but now almost everybody believes that resveratrol for the heart health works only at low dose of resveratrol. And we actually kind of found out all the pathways of resveratrol, how it works on heart. Yes, heart can withstand damaging effect more because we are the first one who also said that resveratrol can induce the autophagy and uh, by autophagy it can reduce the risk of heart attack. And we did some also human study with my former fellow who is now a professor at the University of Osaka, Otani, and who has been working with me for last maybe 30 years or so. So, we all showed whether it is in the laboratory animal model or human model, resveratrol works. So, whatever we said, the whole entire world actually repeated it and they kind of, uh, kind of uh, support our, our findings that indeed resveratrol works for the heart and it gives protection of the heart. Most of the resveratrol papers were cited by CNN, BBC, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, almost everywhere they were. And they were uh, Nelson's rating TV, and they were cited as the top 10 paper. Many of the papers actually during the last two, three years are top 10 papers and cited more than 100 times. But then came the sudden allegations by the university. One wonders, if there is peer review being done at the many scientific journals, did Dr. Doss's alleged falsehoods pass by their scrutiny as well? Dr. Doss was asked why the university chose to air their allegations when he was away from his desk in Connecticut and attending a scientific meeting in India. I have absolutely no idea because as far as I know that they were considering me for according to bylaws of the university for retirement. And since I was approximately age 66, so I agreed to retire and uh, everything was written out for my retirement and everything. So he one day called for the press release and he ignored all the facts and the lawyer, uh, I forgot his name, they put the things together and they all made a big press conference saying that, say, or appearing me like a devil and I did everything wrong for the last 40 years in three different universities and so that he said everything we did is wrong. Dr. Das goes on to explain that his computer was removed from his office and that the subsequent allegations published by the university online focused on altered Western blot images reproduced in scientific journals. While the university showed how these images were altered, it failed to mention that editors of scientific journals demand Western blot images be enhanced for the purpose of visualization when they go to print. All the allegedly false Western blot images shown at the university website and in their lengthy report were not originals. So he took all the computers and inside the computers, whatever are the conversation or, or not the conversation, rather the email chat with, uh, with my colleagues or my students, fellows, they put all the 30 years conversation or email chat like, for example, I'm telling you one example I'm giving. Like, I asked one of my students that 
uh, give me a better picture. And he said, look at that. That means he is asking for manipulation. In fact, we did six or eight copies of the same same uh, pictures or or the sets of pictures and pi has every right to ask for better picture or best picture so that we can publish that representative picture so there is nothing wrong in it so this kind of thing conversation or email chat they took out of uh, about 6 or 8 computers for the last 30 years while Dr. Das was accused of scientific fraud dating back almost 40 years, the fact is that records of this scientific studies are only stored for five years and that Dr. Das cannot access these records in his own defense. He speaks on this here. The National Institute of Heart, who funded my research, they mandates that we keep the data for the last five years and we did keep it is the routine for us to keep the data for five years and most of the journals also mandates that we keep the data available for last five years. And they went for 40 years back and, and there are most of the data were available to my students or fellows who did the experiments. See, I have been asking for the hard disk of my own computer they took. They never gave it to me and then they said that they lost it and we believe they manipulated the hard disk. No, they really did not do that. They took the published papers and just the published paper they used the software to catch any manipulation which is not, uh, not true. So, he just took the computers, he manipulated the computer, disk, he, he destroyed the originals and then he showed that all the data are correct using the incorrect software or the people who did it has no knowledge of what they are doing. Furthermore, the Western blot test only determines the underlying biological mechanisms and is not needed to determine whether resveratrol spares heart muscle tissue from damage during a heart attack. Even if the Western blot test results were fabricated, this would not alter the conclusions of Dr. Doss's research that resveratrol protects the rodent's heart from sudden cardiac death. The evidence for that benefit is conclusively shown in vivid photographs showing resveratrol-treated rodent hearts experience far less damage than untreated hearts. Listen to Dr. Das explain it. Western blot is the, is the, the way to determine the protein level. It is just a blot put on the cellulose paper. It takes about half a day to one day by one person whereas one paper takes almost like 10 people for t 3 years of work up to 3 years of work western blot is a very minor part of the of the whole work so everybody looked at the how resveratrol worked or whether it protected the heart and everybody agrees that it does protect the heart and there is actually there is no controversy from the signaling pathways they made it up this as you know that there was nothing wrong in any of our western blot. They said all the western blot was done by me for last 40 years or 44 years at different university. I did not even do any because I left bench work for last 30 years almost. So, it does not matter who did it. Anybody did touch western blot and where my name is it was involved and they said every western blot was wrong. Again, Dr. Das concedes that Western blot images were altered, but only at the demand of journal editors. Listen to him explain this in his own words. They ask us to enhance it because Western blot is made on the nitrocellulose paper, where the background sometimes is too dark, where the main protein band is difficult to see, so they ask us to enhance it. Enhance means enhancing the blot so that they are clearly visible to the readers and that is what is a routine process and they generally ask us 
to, uh, to 300 to 400 dpi and when we make it they are generally less than 100 dpi and reviewers accept it, but the press when it goes to the press, they, the journals has a different opinion. They think the readers, it should be visible to readers. They always ask us to enhance it. We asked Dr. Das directly if he manipulated scientific data in order to gain more funding for his research. No, that's a lie totally because I have a longest track record of the university. All my grants were m about 30 years old, so they were running for 30 years. I have a million dollar per year grant and the resveratrol research what they put, I never used any of the federal grant, all were my, from my consulting money or from the, uh, from the industrial money. I used and I used very little money for the resveratrol research. I established a center in my own country and uh, I put my own money to, to start the center and where we do the research there, I still am doing the research there and whatever they said, they are all false. They, they just made it up, right? We also asked Dr. Das whether it was true that the review committee at the university would not even consider his appeal, which included evidence in his favor. That is true. They don't want to listen to any argument, and they said what they did is right. Even though the way they did it is wrong, and everybody says it is wrong, NIH says it is wrong, everybody says it is wrong, but they want to stick to the fact that whatever they did is right.